Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the second episode of Sips and Sensibility. Today, we are going to be talking about the 2009 Emma miniseries. If you would like to watch this adaptation, you can get it on Amazon Prime. You will need to have the BritBox subscription, but you can get a free seven-day trial. Lori, what you sipping? Well, to celebrate the final arrival of fall, I am sipping on some Angry Orchard hard cider, and I'm loving it. Beth, what you sipping on? Well, I am sipping on what some may call a chai tea latte. Others may call it uh, chai tea with a little bit of milk and a lot of pumpkin spice seasoning, because that is what I had in my cabinet. So not entirely a latte, if you define a latte as having steamed milk, but it is tea and milk and some honey, and it's really good. Julia, what are you sipping on this evening? Well, ladies, I am sipping on some huckleberry tea from Glacier National Park. Austin and I got it this summer when we went up there. Yeah, I was looking for the brand because I realized last time I didn't say the brand of tea that I was drinking, and it's just Glacier National Park's blend of huckleberry tea. And in case you don't know what huckleberries are, they're wild blueberries. Hmm. I did not know that. It's also a really cool place to be drinking tea from. (laughs) Thank you. Well, like Lori said, we are so excited to be talking about our first adaptation today. We're talking about Emma, the 2009 miniseries, which in my opinion was really well done. And I'm really excited to talk about it with you guys. So just kind of tell me, did you like it? I did. I normally prefer miniseries. I like that they can go into more depth. So I thought this one was really well done. Yeah, I have to agree with Lori. As you guys know from the first episode, my first Austin was that 1990s Emma with Gwyneth Paltrow. So that'll always hold a special place in my heart. And it was really hard not to compare this to that just for simply the nostalgic factor. But I would say that this miniseries was really well done. And overall, I really liked it, especially as Lori said, for all the extra details that we got from the extra, you know, two hours. So I I really liked it. Yeah, I would totally agree. I think that one of the awesome benefits of miniseries is they just get to explore the story a lot more and really flesh it out, which is great, especially when you are adapting something from a novel. So I really enjoyed that part. I will say I don't feel like this miniseries made very many controversial choices which for me makes it feel like it's not that much of a success. Like it's a good version of Emma, but it doesn't really do anything that gets me that excited. I would say that really there's only one choice that kind of deviates in any way from the book. And none of us were even sure if we liked it very much. But like I said, we're going to talk about that later. So I would agree with you definitely there. It felt like it was just very safe in some ways. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's safe. It's good, but it's safe. Hmm. Exactly. Well, critics would agree with us about liking it. I mean, this movie, if you look on Rotten Tomatoes, it has an 83% critic rating, which is pretty great. And it actually has a 100% audience rating. Oh my gosh. I did my best to look for other adaptations of Emma on Rotten Tomatoes, and that was the highest rating for, I believe, both critic and audience for any adaptation of Emma. Are you serious? That's kind of crazy to think about. That kind of surprises me a little bit too, because even though I liked it, like we've all kind of agreed, in terms of Jane Austen adaptations in general, I definitely did not feel like this one was groundbreaking and definitely not worthy of 100. Well, I think it has a 100 because, like you were saying, it is a really safe Hmm. choice. It's a safe miniseries. And, you know, some people may be really passionate about the 2020 Emma, but it made a lot of bold choices. Or the 1996 version with Gwyneth Paltrow also made some different choices. So those might be a little bit harder for people to agree on that they like, but I think this one just across the board is a really solid adaptation that didn't do anything super strange. I feel like discussing how this is a really safe adaptation also lends itself to the same discussion about the music and cinematography and general vibe of this miniseries. The music felt just kind of very normal. The cinematography was just very basic. It was all just very safe. Did you guys agree with me on that? Did you notice anything particularly special about any of those things? 
Yeah, I mean, when I was trying to come up with something to say about the the music and the cin- cinematography, really nothing came to mind because just it didn't stick out. It just was kind of there. There's nothing special about it to me. Yeah, I would agree. I didn't really see anything sticking out or the music didn't stick with me and make me dream romantic dreams. You know, it was very, okay, this goes with any other period piece type of music. One thing I did notice, though, with this being a period piece, and it kind of fits into uh, the cinematography, I guess, was while I was watching it, I realized that it was a period piece. Obviously, it's Emma. But it didn't completely feel like a period piece while I was watching it. There was like weird mannerisms here and there that were happening. And I was like, would those have actually happened? It was just like weird. There was like some places where there was vibes were off. You know, now that you say that, that really helps me put into words something that I feel like I noticed with Emma specifically. Because some of Emma's facial expressions when she's reacting to people, when she's like disturbed or her sensibilities are offended or something like that, she makes very dramatic, disgusted faces that I feel like at the time they were all so much about being prim and proper and having this kind of fake face for society that I was very surprised. But yeah, I feel like that's a great way to describe it. It didn't seem like it fit in the period. I don't know if that's what you specifically were thinking of, but... I feel like that definitely fits into that idea. Yeah, what I was thinking of was watching Emma, like it mainly stood out, um, like with you with Emma, where when she was walking, she wasn't keeping that like gentlewoman, you know, like perfect posture. Like she would throw her leg up on the couch at one point at like a weird angle. It was just like weird things where I looked at her and I was like, I don't think that's something a woman of her standing in that time period would be doing. Like it feels very 20th century, like an actor got out of sync with a character or something. So on that note of that specific character choice Ramala Garai had, whether that was intentional or not, let's talk about Emma's character. So she was played by Ramala Garai. What did you guys think of it? her portrayal of Emma. Now, I know I have some thoughts about this. Do you guys have any opinions about how she portrayed Emma? Well, first of all, Julia, I would just like to give you props for your pronunciation. I mean, I'm pretty sure you're saying it right. You're definitely saying with it, it with enough confidence for me to believe you. So good on you for that. As far as what you guys were saying earlier, that relates to my thoughts on Emma in this film. Just the facial expressions and things that that actress chose to do. It feels like a spunkiness that they were going for, which in some ways doesn't feel true to Emma's character for me. I would agree. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I even had something written down that I wrote during the miniseries that I didn't like her open disgust of Mr. Martin. That's when I first noticed it. Just the very beginning, she's hanging with Harriet. She meets Mr. Martin and she's just making all of these horrified faces. And even though Mr. Martin is below her in class, he is by no means a disgusting individual. And so I felt like that was out of character for Emma. And then she was incredibly ungentle in her delivery of the lines about Mr. Martin and how he's below Emma. Because even though Emma's saying some things that are, no matter how you slice it, pretty hurtful about Mr. Martin and definitely classist, she, in her handling of Harriet, is usually a little bit more subtle. And part of that is because one of Emma's most important qualities is that she's incredibly polite. She cares about public image so much. And so I felt like that was really out of character for her too, Beth, for sure. That just kind of dramatic disgust and dramatic and open disgust of other people, especially Mr. Martin, was just kind of off-putting for me. Yeah, I would agree with that. The actress did a really good job at blatantly and I'm using that word explicitly because I think like you Julia in the novel it wasn't blatant but really good at portraying that classism that Emma has at the beginning like there's definitely points where I was like oh oh girl tone it back a little bit but yeah other than that I mean to me Emma was just Emma there wasn't anything that really stood out about her like I didn't hate her portrayal of it but comparing how I felt about her character to Mr. Knightley who I'm sure we're going to get to in a minute I have way more thoughts and feelings about that portrayal than I do about Emma 
My main takeaway, and I really do think that Romola did a great job portraying Emma, but my main takeaway, and I wrote this down several times, is that I felt like she was incredibly awkward. And maybe that was those facial expressions or her body language, like you were saying, Lori, but it took me out of it a little bit because I think that you can argue that Emma is supposed to be a comical character, but I do not think that you can argue that Austin wrote her as someone who is awkward. Hmm. You know, she's supposed to be genteel and charming. And to me, a lot of her actions just came off as weird. Yeah, definitely. One moment specifically that I thought of when you were saying that, Beth, was when she and Mr. Knightley had their big blow up fight. I believe it was about her meddling in Harriet and Robert Martin's proposal. And they have their big fight and Knightley storms off. And then he turns around to come back to talk to Emma and she hears him and she's kind of plopped on the couch, but she hears him coming and she pops back up, turns around, gets in his face and says, are we going to be friends again? And just really excited. And I was very shocked by that because she went from kind of being a little bit disturbed because throughout that whole fight, Mr. Knightley is much more emotionally attached to the fight than Emma is because she thinks, oh, I just did something right. And Mr. Knightley's being too sensitive, but For her to go from being annoyed with Knightley to just acting like, oh, we haven't fought at all. I'm going to cheerily yell at him about being friends. I thought that was really weird. And I think, as you said, Beth, a little bit awkward. I think it made her seem more like a teenager than she was. The kind of behavior that you would see in like a middle school coming of age story. Like that quick change of emotions. Mm. Which kind of, to me, highlighted the age gap between Emma and Knightley even more. I guess I didn't notice this while I was reading, but I googled it and it was like, Knightley's 36, Emma's 22 or something. And I was like, oh, that's a big age gap. I still feel like, though, even though there is a big age gap for the time period, and especially for Emma being the woman of the house who's running the house and hosting dinner parties, it still didn't totally mesh for me. Yeah, she seems much too childish. Now that we've talked about Emma's childish ways, let's talk a little bit about George Knightley, who was in this adaptation played by Johnny Lee Miller. It looks like Lori has thought she's gesticulating quite a bit. (laughs) I don't know if y'all know, but Johnny Miller also played Sherlock in elementary. This is a big deal because Lori is in love with Sherlock Holmes. (laughs) Let me tell you, it was weird because I was staring at his face the very first episode I was like why do I know him and then I googled it and I was like oh my gosh but yeah I do I do like his acting I think he portrayed Knightley very well honestly I liked his portrayal of Mr. Knightley more than the Mr. Knightley portrayal in my favorite Gwyneth Paltrow Emma old words I know I thought he did a really good job and he is quite the Austin actor because he was also in Mansfield Park as Edmund So he has practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found Mr. Knightley to be very attractive. I also found his burns to be very harsh. Mm, Yeah, they really stuck. Yeah, the delivery on a lot of the things that he says to Emma, it it made me like wince a little bit at points. The badly done scene made me get a lot of secondhand embarrassment. Like that whole like segment, I kind of had to walk away from my computer. And even though... Some might argue it was a little harsh. I also feel like this adaptation's portrayal of Emma and Frank and their interactions with each other, they were so flirty, which also didn't feel very period to me either, just on that again. But they were so flirty with each other. And Emma's burn of Miss Bates, it felt deserved. Even though it was harsh, it felt deserved. And I think this adaptation, Johnny Lee Miller really built up his connection with Emma and you could see him pining over Emma throughout the film. This was the head of that coming to fruition or coming to light. I would agree. A lot of his acting is more subtle, but you can see it. It's like subtly loud, if you will. Like I think one of my favorite scenes is you can see him in the window when Emma and Mr. Elton are talking and it's like, you know He's listening and trying to hear what's happening because he's already jealous. And he just embodies Knightley well to me. There are a lot of, we see a lot of shots of him walking, like in that kind of that scene you were just talking about too, Lori, where you see his full body and he just comes off as someone who is 
confident and who has knowledge and who has power and wisdom. And I think Johnny Lee Miller did a really good job of embodying this character. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. So another character that I feel like is very noteworthy in this film is Harriet Smith, who is played by Louise Daniel. May I just say her portrayal was, for me, the perfect balance of likable person and airhead. You know, I liked Harriet, but yes, and I would agree with what you said, Lori. I think the main thing that I noticed right away was Louise is a really pretty actress, but they really did her dirty with that hairdo. Oh, oh my gosh. Harriet is not supposed to be that beautiful, but they chose a beautiful actress and then they just like really screwed up her hair. It really reminded me of that scene from Princess Diaries where she's like, I look like a moose. And Paolo goes, but a very cute moose. Make all the boy moose go. she looks like a poodle oh but you know Lori, it's funny that you say she's the perfect combo of airhead and nice i actually thought she was too ditzy i was a little bit disturbed by just how ditzy they portrayed her and i thought it was funny and you know it highlighted well the idea that she and emma are not intellectual equals but it also led to emma being short with her a couple of times especially during the riddle scene she kind of snapped at her and it just was not my favorite portrayal of harriet that i've ever seen Although I did love the pencil moment when she's being painted and you get to watch how specifically she found Mr. Elton's pencil. She reaches for it and then hides it. I thought that was really hilarious. She kind of reminded me of a poodle, honestly. Yeah. (laughs) There was like a perkiness to her and that really curly hair. And like you're seeing that little bit of ditziness. It was it was just like very poodle like to me. I don't know why, but that that was a big takeaway. I feel like it really, or this adaptation really pushed the Emma sees Harriet more as a pet or a pet project than a friend. And I think they really pushed that to the foreground in this, maybe a little too much, but it's definitely visible. Yeah, I think this adaptation made some choices that even though I didn't love their portrayal of Harriet, it did really bring to the foreground, like you were saying, Lori, Harriet's not her equal. She's taking care of her. She sees her as a project. And then on the other hand, you see Jane, who's featured a lot more than in some other adaptations. And you definitely see how Jane is a better match for her in terms of friendship. So I do see what you're saying. It played overall a bigger picture purpose that I did like. But there were just certain times where I got a little annoyed with her. I'm not going to (laughs) lie. Yeah, that riddle scene that you were talking about where Emma. I, at least when I watched it, I guess I didn't see her snap at her. But when they're doing it and Harriet keeps guessing and Emma's just like, uh-huh, good job, Harriet. It, like, I feel like in that moment, Emma would have been like patting Harriet on the head. <laughs> yeah. You know, that, that's kind of the vibe I was getting. I could totally see that. So we talked about Harriet and that scene with Mr. Elton where she grabs her his pencil one thing that i thought was really interesting in this adaptation was the portrayal of mr elton which was by the actor blake ritson i thought it was interesting one thing that i noticed in this adaptation that was a little different both from the book and other movies was that elton is unmistakably into emma there's no kind of going around this and saying that you're any kind of rational third party person that you would ever think that he was into Harriet. All of his attention is focused on Emma, which did two things for me that I didn't love. One, I thought it made Emma look a little bit oblivious, which she does make two wrong heart matches in this book, but I don't think she's supposed to be that oblivious. And two, it made me feel even worse for Harriet because it made her seem, like I've said, even more ditzy, that she didn't pick up on Mr. Elton's obvious interest in Emma. My initial thought on Mr. Elton was, and I'm sure you're going to get some flack for saying this, but he was actually kind of cute. He's not that unattractive. I would agree. I would agree. He wasn't as ugly as he sometimes is portrayed. But what stood out to me the most was I felt like he was going for like this really sexy voice. Like his voice is really deep and kind of raspy. And that is the main thing I noticed kind of bothered me. Yeah, I wrote a little note down here about how this was the beginning of the movie. I said, Mr. Elton is just creepy enough. Love it. And then the movie went on and I was like, oh, he's a little too creepy. They kind of portray him as this 
ladies' man. And Mr. Knightley even says he knows he's attractive at some point, I think. And so the idea that Mr. Elton is super into the ladies and they're falling all over him was just very different. And I wasn't sure how I felt about it. One of my favorite quotes, and I believe this is Mr. Knightley saying this about Mr. Elton. He says, that man is so full of himself. I'm surprised he can stay on that horse. (laughs) And that was just so good to me. I Like you, Julia, I agree. Mr. Elton was just like he was cute and he felt, you know, like normal at first. He was a little weird, but you know, there's always that one character who you're like, eh, sorry, guy. As time got on, again, like you, he got way too creepy. And at one point, I was like, I don't know if I'd be in a room alone with you. You know, like I was getting that vibe. Especially that holiday party scene when he wouldn't leave her alone. It was very, very creepy. I think we've all been there. Man follows you around, won't leave you alone. Ooh. I think we'll all be remiss if we don't talk about the donkey scene. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Probably Mr. Elton's <laughs> best moment in this entire miniseries. <laughs> Lori, I know you have some thoughts. The visual metaphor that this director used was beautiful. May I just say that? Bravo to you, sir or ma'am. The image of Mr. Elton pulling the donkey that Mrs. Elton is riding on and it being very difficult for him. And he just looks miserable. He looks so miserable. So like annoyed and like defeated. That image is just like, hmm. you can you can see what the metaphor is doing. You know, you can see it. Well, I just loved I think they do such a good job of showing how, you know, at the beginning when Mrs. Elton is first introduced, Mr. Elton is obviously so taken with her. And by the end of the film, I mean, that donkey scene is a very pivotal moment in their relationship. By the end of the film, you can just see he's like, I, I've made a mistake. This is <laughs> terrible. That woman, whoever that actress is, played her to a T. I mean, that woman just not a fan of her christina cole yes she did a great job at playing just the woman that everyone loves to hate i feel like her being as dramatically annoying as she was in this adaptation also made you just feel even worse for jane fairfax's character who was just incredibly sympathetic in this portrayal i thought But speaking of Jane Fairfax, I think we all have some thoughts on this adaptation's portrayal of Frank Churchill, who was portrayed by Rupert Evans, who my husband let me know was actually in a TV show called Man in High Castle, which I've never seen, but I think a lot of you do watch. I love that show. I definitely have some thoughts about Frank Churchill. I think this adaptation made him look kind of like an angsty frat boy Mm. honestly that is spot on the level of just woe is me i am the worst like i've had the worst life ever which i mean granted he's had a not great life but he was also raised by like a fairly well-to-do aunt he's not in a miss Bates situation here so his like dramatic moment when they finally travel to the hill of him going, I'm going to leave this country and just kind of angstily yelling it into the sky was like, he's having a temper tantrum. He is. Oh, I couldn't stand Frank in this adaptation. I mean, yes, given he did kind of remind me of some guys I knew in college, but (laughs) just his, oh, the way he treats Jane, the comments that he makes to her and his flirtation with Emma, it it just felt like too much to me. I mean, to Mm -hmm. the point where I knew that him and Jane were going to get married and end up together. But to the point where that was shocking to me that that happened because of the extreme of that flirtation with Emma and of those really cutting comments to Jane. I agree. Lori, you mentioned the moment at the picnic, but also when he shows up to that party at Mr. Knightley's house and he's past Jane and it puts him in a bad mood, but he passes Emma as he's walking up to the house And he's just complaining about how hot it is. And he's just in general being a huge butt. And she's trying to be nice to him. And then he walks up to the house and he's just being rude to everyone. And it was completely unnecessary. He was taking out all of his angst on literally everyone around him. Like you said, Beth, too, 
the level, we've talked about this, but the level of flirtation with Emma, the thing that surprised me most, it wasn't only verbal flirtation, which I would say I'd assume was fairly common at this time, but there was also some physical flirtation too. Like he was laying his head in her lap, things like that, that number one did not seem period. And number two, it was- No, it did not. Yes. And it was just so obvious and you could see the hurt on poor Jane's face that it was shocking at the end to find out that that whole time they were still engaged. And what he's frustrated about is his aunt. He has no reason to be frustrated with Jane. So his behavior through that was, it just really turned me off to his character. And I don't know that we can totally, to be fair, blame this on Rupert Evans because some of it is to blame on the dialogue. There were things that he was directed to say, like I said, some of the complaining, things like that. I'm sure some of the movements were directed, but gosh, in general, I'll find Frank somewhat sympathetic, but this adaptation made me hate him. And then at the end, when he and Jane were having this glorious moment where they got to kiss in the street, I wanted to feel happy for them, especially for Jane, but I couldn't because I was like, man, you're getting stuck with this dude who just stinks big time. Yeah, like throughout the whole adaptation, like if you did not read Emma or you didn't know what was happening, you would 100% believe Frank was at least somewhat courting Emma. The way that he picks her up in the ballroom and like swings her around dancing when they're planning that ball was just kind of like, I don't think that would have happened at all, period. But the level, like you're saying, Julia, of the flirtation with Emma is like, I think, too much for the cover up that he's trying to do. Like, I think you would assume, you know, okay, yes, there's something, but in your mind's eye, you'd be like, okay, you might catch a couple like side glances at Jane. You know, I mean, I don't think he would outright treat her like trash, like he kind of is in this adaptation. Absolutely. One other thing that I wanted to mention was Mr. Woodhouse. I felt like it was a pretty normal adaptation of Mr. Woodhouse, but he was played by dear Michael Gambon. Yes, everyone's favorite wizard, Dumbledore. Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore. I can't tell you how happy I was when I saw him. I know. It just warmed <laughs> my heart. It does. It warms your heart. His voice, honestly, listening to him reminded me of Mr. Bennett from Kira Knightley's, but in the kind of like the way that he would kind of almost like drone a little bit. It was weird in my mind that I connected those two. But may I just say that man has more anxiety than I do. <laughs> and he needs to, you know, drink some tea, calm down. Hmm. Speaking of those differences of period pieces and this adaptation, the book to movie accuracy for me, I felt was like there, but there was definitely some things that were different. Yeah, I would agree with that. I feel like for the most part, it was fairly accurate. There were just a couple of small things. Like I said, Harriet was a little bit too ditzy. Emma was a little bit too rude. And then Frank was more obnoxious than I felt like he was in the book. When I watched the movie, I was just really taken aback by how they handled the reaction from the village after Emma's comments to Miss Bates. I mean, she goes into the village in the whole village knows and people are not talking to her they're avoiding her and that felt like a weird choice to me and a weird way to change things up i will say i wondered i think we had talked about this in the last episode but it seems like for the most part this movie is portrayed from the perspective of just the audience we're just watching what's happening especially with mr elton if we're watching from emma's perspective we wouldn't see so clearly how he's flirting with her but in that scene specifically, I felt like we we're supposed to see things from Emma's perspective. I think we're going to talk about this later, but there were a lot of voiceovers that happened in the movie. In that scene, I feel like the cameras are showing us what Emma's seeing. Oh, everybody hates me. And because you're right, it seemed a little bit too dramatic. I might be totally wrong on what they're trying to do there, but that is how I perceived it. And I think that was just because I felt like if they were trying to make us think that that was real, it was just not very believable to me. Yeah, I think that's a probably a good way to think about it. The other thing that really was so odd to me was how they showed us that those scenes at the beginning, those kind of background scenes with the kids. What do you guys think of that? You know, <laughs> I actually had a lot of thoughts about that. When they were first showing us the history of Jane and Frank and Emma, how they all lost 
a parent and then Jane and Frank both got sent away from their families, but Emma got to stay. First of all, it highlights again just how fortunate Emma is, but it also shows you kind of the the connection that Jane and Emma and Frank all have to each other through their connection to Highbury. Even though Jane Austen mentions that in the novel, it's not necessarily something that would really stand out to you. So I feel like that to me at first, I was like, wow, that's such an interesting way to open this novel. But they really lost me on it because even though I thought it was cool at first, there was a line when Emma says to Harriet, I believe it's Harriet. She says, Frank and Jane and I are bound in a mysterious way. And I was like cringing so hard because it was just so on the nose. And it just felt like they were saying, oh, in case you didn't pick up on it, they are bound together in a mysterious way. And I was like, you just showed us that you don't need to tell us. And it felt a little bit lazy to me. I don't know. So I thought it was cool at first, and then they really lost me on it. That's how I felt. One of my favorite parts about talking about Emma is getting to talk about the proposal scenes. And in this book, we have not one, but two proposals. The first one doesn't go so well, but the second one is pretty great. So (laughs) let's start off. And I just want to hear y'all's thoughts on Elton's proposal to Emma. I was having extreme flashbacks to the Mr. Collins proposal because of this line, which he says, you always refuse the first proposal. Yes. And Collins, yes, he does say something like that. Yeah. Polite ladies always refuse the first time. I was so shocked to hear that line in here. And it, I didn't know if it totally fit. I don't think it fit, but I was like, oh, 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 I'm having flashbacks. I don't (laughs) enjoy this. I think it made it infinitely more awkward. The setup for it was so interesting. I mean, they were just so obvious with the carriages and all of that. It made it kind of comical. But also, I was just laughing the whole time during the scene because Emma is leaning forward and her eyes are just like bulging out of her head. (laughs) She's so wide-eyed and so shocked by what she's hearing that, I mean, she does just have like her eyes sticking out of her head. And then Elton, he's so sweaty. He's just like sweating up a storm. I mean, obviously it makes sense that he would be nervous, but it's just such a funny juxtaposition. Like Elton, sweaty, nervous, Emma, eyes bulging, leaning forward. I mean, just too good. That's gold right there. You would think she'd be leaning away from that conversation, not leaning towards it. Like, girl, opposite direction. I also feel like it's just the two things that you don't want on either side of a proposal. You don't want the dude to be so nervous he's sweating. And you definitely don't want the girl to be that shocked. Which, again, I will say, I was surprised she was so shocked because he made it pretty obvious. Great. Well, now that we have the um, weird gross one out of the way, (laughs) why don't we talk about this movie's kind of pivotal moment, the proposal scene with Knightley and Emma. So So sweet. sweet. I love that you both just said that at the same time. (laughs) But really, that is a good way to sum up this proposal scene. It was truly very sweet. Yes. The way that she was freaking out, thinking that he was going to be like, I'm in love with Harriet. And then he's like, it's you. I like you. I want to marry you. She's like, oh, okay. I will say again, though. Even though I thought it was a very sweet proposal and I loved Johnny Lee Miller clearly trying to feel Emma out and slowly warn her about what was about to happen. And I thought that Romala did a good job of slowly coming to the realization and showing her anxiousness. Again, it wasn't groundbreaking to me. I thought it was sweet. I thought it was romantic, but nothing happened that stood out to me very much. It didn't really make me feel that much. Mm -hmm. Like, I enjoyed watching it, but I wasn't just, like, overcome like I have been watching some other Jane Austen films with that. Oh, it's finally happening. They're finally together. And I feel warm and happy. I was, I mean, I was glad, but it wasn't, it didn't stir up any emotion. Honestly, one moment I'll say that I felt like was sweeter than the proposal was, and honestly, it was kind of funny. Emma storms into nightly study And she's like, we can't get married. I'm sorry. And then slams the door. And then he runs after her. He's like, dude, Emma, what are you talking about? And she tells him she can't possibly leave her dad. And then he tells her that he's already thought about it. And they're going to live at Highbury. Honestly, that moment to me felt 
more special and sweet than the proposal, which I think is because they made the choice of portraying it like Emma comes in in hysterics and Knightley's like, I've already thought about it. I've already got you. I know you. I predicted this. Like, I felt like that moment was sweeter. And it's because they did something new in a way. Yeah, I definitely believed that they were in love. And I do really like the chemistry between Romola and Johnny Lee Miller. I thought that that was really well done. What did you guys think about their relationship? Did you, did you believe that they were in love? Did you think that the chemistry worked or that it didn't work? I could definitely see from his point of view, like that he liked her the entire time. You know, just like the little things that he did, like every, almost every time you see him, he's at her house. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, he's over there, which I think kind of is like a nice mirror to that end scene that you were talking about, Julia, where he's like, I like I've been at your house this entire time. Of course, we're going to live there. Um, but yeah, I totally found the chemistry to be real. I think hers, her like taking her time to kind of come to it was interesting. I definitely can see Emma and his relationship budding. And I do think it's sweet. Like you said, Beth, I'm not knocked. My socks aren't knocked off. I also thought it was a really sweet proposal. I definitely thought they had chemistry. And I think we all kind of agree, definitely on Johnny Lee Miller's part, you can see him pining, especially in the dance scene. He's watching her dance. You see, it's almost like a slow-mo smiling motion um, moment at him when they dance together. It's such a sweet scene. It's nothing groundbreaking, but it's definitely sweet and sincere. And I think also Johnny Lee Miller's kind of blatant jealousy throughout the movie towards both Frank and Elton really helped me believe his sincere affection for Emma. And again, I do think I really did believe their chemistry, especially at the end when Emma finally realizes her feelings. You kind of see that parallel between Knightley's jealousy and Emma's jealousy Mm -hmm. when Mrs. Elton just calls him Knightley and Emma's walking back and she is ranting. She's mad. I've known him my entire life and I will never call him Knightley. Like you can tell girl likes him and she just does not know it. Mm, yes. I love that. All right, ladies. What was your make it or break it moment? I have some thoughts. What are yours? My, what made the movie for me, I'll start with that, was the scene as soon as after the proposal, after Emma freaking out about where they were going to live and they go and tell her father. And it's really, really simple. I mean, we don't even see really them telling him, but they walk in and we see the shot from behind. And so we see the backs of Knightley and the back of Emma and they're going in to tell him and they just start holding hands. And that was just so sweet and precious. And, you know, we really don't need to see that scene where they tell him and are explaining the whole thing, but they did a great job of just showing us that love there and kind of showing us what was going to happen. Now, what broke the movie for me was all of the voiceover and the flashbacks. I did not enjoy that. I felt it was totally unnecessary and really took me out of the story. I think there were five or six times that they utilized flashback and several times where we heard Emma's voice over those flashbacks or even just in another instance. And I really, really didn't like it. Yeah, I would totally agree. I feel like we're definitely on the same page, Beth. So my make it, I loved that scene that you were talking about with Emma and Knightley holding hands. But I think the main thing that I really loved that this adaptation did, it really highlighted the fact that Emma had never traveled before. It kind of talks about it slowly throughout the movie. You see her kind of dreaming about going to Box Hill, which is just a couple miles from her house. And then finally... At the end of the movie, Knightley takes her to the seaside. And it's just this really sweet scene where they walk hand in hand up the hill. And the final scene is just them looking out over the sea. And I just thought that was such a special and sweet moment because you see Emma wrestling throughout the film with, well, Jane and Frank, they've traveled, but it's just because I don't want to travel. That's why I haven't traveled. But you know, deep down that she wants to broaden her horizons. And I just love that they have Knightley taking her to the seaside at the end because it's just kind of symbolic for the way he's brought in her horizons mentally and now physically they're seeing a new space. And I thought that was a really sweet 
And then the thing that broke it for me, I actually had two things. Beth, I definitely agree. The voiceovers were just pretty, pretty tragic. And I also felt like one specific flashback that they did quite a few times was of Jane being rescued. And I thought that was really weird because they never capitalized on it. I wondered if there was going to be a time where they showed us a flashback of what actually happened. It wasn't quite so romanticized or something like that, but they never did anything with it. And so that really bothered me. The other thing that really broke the movie for me was that they didn't tie the bow, in my opinion, on Emma and Harriet's relationship. She was incredibly ditzy throughout the film, which made her fall even harder for both Elton and Mr. Knightley, especially. You could see how much she loved him And it never showed you Emma talking to Harriet or apologizing. It showed you, of course, the end where she gets married to Robert Martin, but you never got to see the resolution of that friendship between Emma and Harriet. And I really felt like even though Miss Bates arguably is the moment where you think that Emma's hurt somebody the most, her treatment of Harriet is one of the biggest crimes throughout the film. And I never felt like she really had to face those consequences, which she does in the book. And so that really bothered me. I think for me, what makes this movie is Knightley himself. Like, I think the acting and the portrayal was really well done. But my make it moment was kind of was that ball scene where you can see everyone's distress on their face about Harriet. And Harriet's, you know, you can see she's sad, but everyone is like, not panicked, but like, in distress about it like Emma isn't paying attention to the dance Miss Bates is obviously making conversation about it you know other people are noticing and Knightley is looks like he's contemplating it and then he goes and he asks her to dance and you know she lights up and everyone looks immediately relieved like just that moment of him swooping in and kind of saving Harriet kind of proves his character in that moment and for me that was a make it moment the break it moment dear heavens, was definitely Frank Churchill. His portrayal through the entire time, I just could not stand him. Like, at first, you meet him and you're like, oh, okay, he's cute. He seems nice. He seems into <laughs> Emma. And then you realize that this guy, kind of in the movie, seems like he's two-timing in, like, hindsight, which, if you'd never read the book or anything, you wouldn't have noticed that. But It just, it makes you mad at him. And then he's acting like a three-year-old at certain points. And you're just like, dear heavens, shut up. Okay, I'm really excited to hear your response to this question. Lori, from this adaptation, who would you date? And you better answer correctly. (laughs) Well, sorry. (laughs) I, I think it's already kind of been hinted at. But I will save that name for a minute. At first watching I did think it was going to be nightly you know you go on and then we meet Frank and I'm like oh he's real cute and then he starts acting like a jerk uh and that immediately ruins that romanticized vision and then nightly swoops in and is saving everyone and is being a gentleman you're like huh swoon so yes Johnny Lynn Miller call me Mm, good choice Lori Johnny Lee if you want Lori's digits please DM us how old is he I don't. I think he's in his forties. Yeah, that's a little old for you, Lori. Twenty-ish year age difference. Yeah, that might be too much. But yes, that betrayal. I would choose him in that moment. He's almost fifty. Just. Oh dear. <laughs> well, Lori, I'm not at all surprised that you went with Mr. Knightley. I'm going to very eagerly anticipate the day that you do not get with our good friend George. So we've talked about our movie. We've all said our thoughts, and man, there has been a lot of them. Tell me about your drink. Did you enjoy it? And most importantly, did you finish it? I really enjoyed my Huckleberry tea. It's one of those things where you smell it, and it smells so good, and the taste lives up to the smell, which I feel like is pretty rare. It's super fruity. It reminds me of the mountains in Glacier National Park, which is just incredibly beautiful if you've never been, but I must disappoint you all. And also maybe not surprise some of you by saying, no, I did not finish my tea. (laughs) And I'm sorry. (laughs) Lori, how did you like your drink? I quite enjoyed it, having the first apple cider of the season. I did finish it. Uh, This brand isn't my absolute favorite. It's good. But hopefully I will 
have my favorite brand on later. Beth, how did you enjoy your drink? I'm going to be honest. It was not great. Oh, oh no. So sad. Chai's can be really hit or miss. Yeah, I, my husband and I have been in a pursuit of the perfect homemade chai for quite some time. And it has not been going super well for us. I'm not a coffee drinker, and so a London Fog or a chai tea latte are typically my go-to drinks at any coffee shop. Sometimes they really suck, but sometimes they're really wonderful. And I just can't quite replicate the wonderful ones at home. The pumpkin pie spice was kind of nice, but it didn't really mix in well, and so there's just kind of clumps of spices, and ugh, it was kind of gross. Yep, that that doesn't sound great. That's really unfortunate, Beth. So I'm going to assume you didn't finish it. Actually, I did finish it. I've actually had two of them already today. (laughs) In the last two hours-ish, I've had two. (laughs) I just, if there's a drink in front of me, I just drink it. Yeah, see, that's where you and I are different. So now that we've talked about Austin and adaptations... And you've heard about our sips. All that's left to do is give us a rate. Follow us on Instagram. We're at Sips and Sensibility Pod. Remember to follow us, interact with our posts, send us a DM if you have any suggestions, comments, or concerns. And you can like and follow our Facebook page, which is Sips and Sensibility. And make sure to come back and listen to us next time. Thanks so much for listening to us today. We hope that you enjoyed our conversation on the 2009 Emma miniseries. Be sure to come back and join us in two weeks as we talk about the 1996 Gwyneth Paltrow version of Emma. We can't wait to talk about it and we can't wait for you guys to listen in. In the meantime, if you would like to watch the Gwyneth Paltrow version in anticipation of our next episode, you can find it for free on Hulu or HBO Max. We'll see you in two weeks.